It's a meeting reminiscent of the Cold War era. NATO and Russia talked in Brussels with relations said to be at a critically low level. So exactly what does each side actually want? Is an armed conflict now likely or does diplomacy still have a chance? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Peter Dobby. A high stakes meeting between Russia and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, over Ukraine ended without a breakthrough. Politicians and military men from both sides said significant differences remained during what they described as frank and open discussions. More talks are underway, but failing to reach an understanding means the risk of armed conflict in Europe is very real. The US and NATO have been increasingly concerned about a Russian military buildup near the border with Ukraine. Ukraine. The arrival of more than 100,000 soldiers and tanks, artillery and long-range rocket units prompted fears about a ground invasion. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has repeatedly denied that while also warning NATO against expanding near its border. Both NATO and the US rejected the Kremlin's demands on security, among them a guarantee that NATO will not accept Ukraine and other former Soviet nations as members. This crisis is a, is, is, is a making of Russia. And therefore, it is important that they de-escalate. Uh, Ukraine has the right to self-defense. Uh, that's enshrined in the UN uh, uh, founding charter. And, of course, some NATO allies, well, NATO allies and NATO, help them to uh, uphold uh, that uh, right to, uh, to self-defense. Together, the United States and our NATO allies made clear we will not slam the door shut on NATO's open door policy, a policy that has always been central to the NATO alliance. If Russia walks away, however, it will be quite apparent they were never serious about pursuing diplomacy at all. That is why collectively we are preparing for, ever, for every eventuality. Russia's deputy foreign minister said NATO's position is unacceptable for Moscow. If NATO opts for the policy of deterring Russia, we will respond with measures of counter-deterrence. If it uses the policy of intimidation, we will respond with counter-intimidation. If it looks for vulnerabilities in the Russian defense system, we will look for NATO's vulnerabilities. It's not our choice, but we don't have other options if we don't overturn this current very dangerous course of events. The tensions between NATO and Moscow can be traced to the Crimean Peninsula, where Russia has one of its most important naval bases. In 2014, Ukraine's pro-Russian government was toppled following months of protests. Russia responded by seizing control of Crimea. Pro-Russian separatists then declared independence in Donetsk and Luhansk after a referendum was held. That triggered a conflict between Ukraine and the separatists. Despite a ceasefire agreed in Minsk, sporadic fighting has never really stopped. In 2016, NATO deployed battle groups to Baltic states and Poland in response to the annexation of Crimea. The latest tension started last year, when Russia mobilized 100,000 soldiers near its border with Ukraine. OK, there we are. Here we go. Let's bring in our guests. Joining us from Brussels, we have Teresa Fallon, director of the Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies. In Moscow, we have Pavel Felgenhauer. Uh, he's a defense and military analyst. And in Oslo, we have Glenn Deason. He's a professor of international relations at the University of Southeastern Norway. Welcome to you all. Teresa, coming to you first. Is this a moment of truth in the relationship between Russia and NATO? I think there's a giant sigh of relief that the meeting actually took place because Russia, there was rumors that they might not even have the meeting with NATO if the meeting in Geneva with the U.S. didn't go so well. So it's a promising sign that they actually had the meeting. It's the first time they've done it in two years. And the meeting lasted longer than anticipated by an extra hour. But there are two problems now. We have the problem of Ukraine. Uh, tensions are extremely high and it's clear, according to Wendy Sherman in her press conference yesterday, that NATO is not willing to shut the door. Uh, they're going to maintain their open door policy, and it's up to countries if they really want to apply to NATO that they're leaving the door open. And this is something that President Putin has been clear that he wants a treaty uh, outlining that 
neither Ukraine nor Georgia could ever join NATO. So this is something I don't know how they're going to get around. So this is kind of an intractable point right now. And many analysts have wondered, did Putin make these maximalist uh, requests to see how much he would get in return? So this is, uh, everyone's unclear about what Putin is doing. Uh, he has, if we had followed, if, if his demands include all EU all the countries that joined NATO post-1997 would have to leave. And so in many respects, what he is doing by surrounding Ukraine with 100,000 soldiers, some haven't seen that as blackmail, uh, trying to get negotiations, but others in Russia feel that finally we're being heard. So it remains to be seen. But the other issue is that is Putin miscalculating? Because in many respects, he is creating uh, a backlash. Uh, we've seen Sweden and Finland signal that they, instead of leaving NATO that right now, that they're considering joining NATO. So instead of decreasing the size of country, the amount of countries in NATO, Putin inadvertently is actually increased, perhaps could be increasing the size of NATO. Pavel Felgenhauer in Moscow. Is there a chance that perhaps the feeling in the Kremlin, i.e. Mr. Putin's settled position on this is, why should NATO be allowed to cherry pick from our list of demands? Well, that is the official position that Russia has been telling before these meetings, during these meetings, and also likely after the meetings, that these uh, Russian demands should be accepted or else. So now we're most likely moving into the or else uh, time frame. Of course, today there's a meeting in Vienna, OSC, discussing the same thing. It's obvious there won't be any breakthrough there because that's not the forum where you can achieve any kind of uh, compromise or agreement on anything much, at least not in one day. Uh, so too many nations there are represented, you need unanimity to get anything. So today, uh, the Russian main negotiator, Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov, said that maybe we right now won't be even planning any new meetings with America or with NATO or with the West. We'll be considering our countermeasures, which will be military or military technical in nature. That means Russia will be planning military responses to uh, the, uh, what, uh, uh, NATO, the rejection by the West of Russian demands. Ryabko said maybe we'll be deploying uh, Russian military infrastructure to Venezuela and Cuba. But he said that's kind of maybe yes, maybe not. That's just sort of one of the options. Okay. So right now, Russia is considering options on the military technical response. Glenn so Deason in Oslo. In the US, for the United States, for Mr. Blinken, clearly the idea of either a bilateral or a unilateral deal, self-standing, self-supporting over Ukraine, was toxic. It was someplace the US didn't want to go. Was that the best attitude and the best approach to have ahead of the NATO meeting? Uh, no, I think uh, there will there have to be some kind of flexibility because <clears throat> uh, the reason why we have this standoff is because uh, we really need a solution to what, what is the pan-European secur security uh, architecture. Uh, we initially had a lot of deals on this topic. I mean, in the early 90s, well, in 1990, 94, and 99, we had all these agreements uh, on pan-European security where all sides agreed on the principle of indivisible security. So one side should not expand their security at the expense of the other. But uh, what Blinken is reflecting is this new uh, argument by NATO, which was that the real principle of European security should be uh, the right of NATO uh, to expand. And, uh, and, and, and this is the main problem, because these two, um, uh, these two principles, they do not harmonize. So, uh, so this is kind of why we have this conflict. Uh, the U.S. insists on the right of NATO to expand, and uh, Russia insists it will not permit NATO to expand anymore. So um, this, this idea that, uh, that not giving an inch to Russia is a diplomatic victory to stand up to the Russians, it doesn't really make much sense, because now the only uh, solution left without a diplomatic solution to this standoff is simply for Russia to have to rely on its military to prevent further NATO expansion. And, and uh, just on a final note, this is 
um, this idea of elevating NATO above any pan-European security agreements. This was also reflected in other areas. For example, NATO-Russia Founding Act of 97, this clearly stipulates that NATO should not put any permanent troops in new member states. However, now NATO Secretary General suggests that the NATO can't discriminate against new and old members. So effectively, NATO has all these new principles which doesn't allow it to actually abide by the pan-European security agreements it's uh, assigned on to in the past. So it's um, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's a standoff, and uh, I don't think Blinken uh, yeah, was able to move this uh, issue forward in any way. Theresa Fallon in Brussels. When Pavel in Moscow talks about uh, Mr. Putin considering his options, is this what we're seeing? Old Putin, um, you can trust him to be a master of ambiguity, if you will. Doesn't send out mixed signals. Doesn't actually lie, but kind of messes with issues, changes his stance just ever so slightly. So even the big boys of NATO and the big boys of European politics can't quite get a grip on where they think he might decide to go next. That's brilliantly put, because as we know, he was a judo master. And so he's always kind of moving around, watching where the, the best uh, weaknesses are and how can he leverage that to his advantage. So I think that that's a perfect example of how he's approaching uh, these, these talks with NATO. And I think that, first of all, they try to break European unanimity by demanding bilateral talks with the United States, insinuating that the U.S. wouldn't talk to the European allies about European security. Wendy Sherman has had over 100 debriefings before the NATO meeting, after the meeting with the Russians, about security in Europe. So the Europeans are happy, other NATO members are happy, and so she kind of had to make up for the deficit from lack of trust from the Trump administration. So I think that people almost feel overbriefed, but I think that they had to do this in order to reassure them. And, and you know, I think there's a dictator's dilemma going on here, because with Putin, we know, at least even in the Soviet Union, you had a Politburo, you had other people making decisions, but we see that the negotiators must go back physically to Moscow to get new instructions. They're, they don't have the ability to negotiate at all. So they're just given, you know, the, the red lines by Putin, and then they have to try to give these speaking points. So I think that this really hampers uh, the Russian position. And it also creates a lot of concern for countries in Eastern Europe, because they're, dem they're asking now, as, as you pointed out, Jen Stoltenberg, they're asking for reassurance because of Russian aggression. And so they want troops there. They want more help. So I think that, uh, you know, this, he, Putin might have, you know, seriously miscalculated. Glenn Decent back in Oslo there. Does this come down to the Kremlin feeling threatened or feeling that its increasingly large sphere of influence is maybe coming under threat? Or do we have to go further back than that? Because there was a point when the Berlin Wall was just about to fall, James Baker, the then US Secretary of State working for Bush, the, the original George Bush, said to Gorbachev, if you're OK with German unification, NATO will not expand to the east. I promise you that. Fast forward to Boris Yeltsin as Russian president. He had a conversation with the Polish president, Lech Wałęsa, and Lech Wałęsa says, oh, we're thinking about joining NATO. Boris Yeltsin says, Yes, absolutely, feel free. And if you look at the map of Europe, that's why Hitler invaded Poland, because it's only 60 clicks from Berlin to the Polish border, and then from Poland, you just it's a straight-line drive to Ukraine. Well, I, I, th I think that, um, the, obviously, Russia feels very much betrayed from uh, all the broken promises that NATO would not expand. And again, this has been well documented. Uh, however, I think that uh, some of the terminology uh, is quite misleading. For example, this idea that NATO continues to suggest that Russia wants to reassert its sphere of influence. A sphere of influence infers an exclusive zone of influence. However, if we look in places like Ukraine, uh, keep in mind that Ukraine and Russia proposed to the EU in 2013 that let, let's find a common trilateral solution. Ukraine is so divided, if it, if it will make a choose between East or West, it will effectively break into a civil war. Uh, the EU said flatly no, uh, and then supported the coup there. Uh, so again, uh, Russia has, has, has no possibility or any illusions about having exclusive influence in, in Ukraine. What they're trying to prevent is NATO from asserting its sphere of influence in Ukraine. So Russia has actually redefined uh, well, what it previously called in spheres of influence. It's now referring to spheres of interest instead, saying if NATO is going to start operating 
on Russian borders, it has to recognize that it also has security interests there. So moving, for example, NATO into Ukraine is an existential threat to Russia, so they can't make these huge moves without consulting uh, Russia. But obviously, uh, a lot of the Russian affairs uh, it comes from the past. Uh, there's a certain similarity between the, the direction that the US and NATO are moving, which, uh, uh, which is the same path as uh, Nazi Germany had in its days. And obviously, all this rhetoric that NATO is about, you know, um, only including and embracing countries who want to join it, it is primarily an alliance to contain Russia and assert hegemony in Europe. So I, I uh, so I, just on the final point, we'll have to point out when NATO offered um, uh, NATO membership to Ukraine, only approximately 20% of Ukraine's population actually wanted it, uh, which suggests that it's not uh, NATO that's uh, you know, feeling pressure to take in all these countries who want to join. It's, it's NATO that's pushing for expansion. So, again, the, the rhetoric is very much uh, skewed. OK. Pavel Felgenhauer, what happens if NATO goes for the so-called tripwire uh, scenario, which is, and there are apparently, according to De Spiegel today, there are people high up in NATO saying we should do this. We should build our military up in Romania and Bulgaria. How would that be perceived in the Kremlin? Well, not, of course, good. Uh, there has been... Uh, uh, NATO has plans to reinforce its uh, eastern flank or eastern front, I don't know. Um, now, with the uh, troops, there's the standing plan of 30 plus 30 plus 30 plus 30 in 30 days, 30 battalions, 30 warships and 30 squadrons of warplanes should be moved to Poland, the Baltics, and to Romania and maybe Bulgaria. Though at present, Bulgaria, the defense minister said that Bulgaria is not very interested in uh, stationing NATO troops, doesn't feel itself threatened, doesn't have a connection really to even Ukraine, not talk about Russia, but uh, Romania, Poland, the Baltic states will uh, gladly accept more troops. And if you begin moving troops, that's a very serious problem uh, because NATO would take a lot of time to bring, say, a tank division from Texas. Uh, to Poland or Estonia or Romania takes a lot of time and effort. It's a long way by sea, by land. Uh, for Russia to move its forces uh, from the Volga region or okay. even from Siberia, to it's, it's, it's much shorter. So there's going to could be a scramble who deploys first. That's how the First World War began. When troop movements begin, before even war is declared and anyone crosses the border, you already get into a slippery slope from which you can't easily extract yourself, or maybe not at all. Okay. You get into a spiral of uh, uh, escalation. Okay, and Theresa Fallon, just, just to pause you there, Pavel, because right we are heading towards the end of the program. Theresa Fallon in Brussels. Does Mr. Putin want to kind of recreate the old USSR in his image? He's not growling at the Baltics because he can't, but if we examine what happened. In Georgia 2008, the Crimea 2014, today in Kazakhstan, today outside, just outside of Ukraine, sounds look like a, a sphere of influence. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, hello, it's a Russian duck. We have to remember who Putin is. He's a Soviet man and he's 70 years old and he's looking at his legacy and what is he going to be known for? So I think his dream is to kind of reanimate this old kind of Soviet idea and not the Soviet Union, but to have this massive Russia sphere of influence. So his moves in Kazakhstan played on television all across Russia, how great Russia was, you know, helping their Kazakh friends and how strong and powerful they were. And I think that that is what's animating this. And everyone here knows that Ukraine cannot join NATO. There is a frozen conflict, not so frozen really, in Ukraine. So NATO cannot accept any country that is in conflict. So neither Georgia nor Ukraine can possibly join NATO. Putin knows this. And so others are concerned that what he fears more, because he knows it can't join NATO with these frozen conflicts, but 
What he fears more is a democratic Ukraine right on its border. And that is deep down what he, he is very deeply concerned about. So I think that Russia under Putin, I mean, the next generation will be a very different leadership. So can, can we hold on? How long is Putin going to stay in power? And you mentioned Kazakhstan. There's a really important lesson that uh, Putin took away from that. Nursultan uh, Nazarbayev had kind of a semi-retirement, and that would keep him, him and his family safe. But he's been removed from power. So Putin took away from that that he can never retire. So he has to keep moving and keep going. And, and there are some even in Moscow talking about we have to inspire the imperial uh, Russian movement that will keep our country going. Okay. And I think that inside domestically, there's a lot of economic issues he has to deal with. Thanks. Glenn Deason, in the next minute or so, not wishing to be too sensationalistic or, or, or too prophet of doom about the whole thing. Is there a dynamic here that maybe NATO doesn't understand? NATO has a long timeline for these discussions. Moscow has a short timeline. And if anyone blows it at the talks, Russia will invade Ukraine. Well, I don't think it will necessarily invade Ukraine. There's a, again, there's a misrepresentation here. I, I would define Russia as a status quo power. When it intervened in Georgia, it did not invade the whole country as others expected. It only cemented its existing position in South Ossetia. It could have invaded Ukraine easily in 2014. It didn't. It only cemented its existing position in Crimea and prevented uh, Ukraine from joining NATO by, by supporting Donbass. Uh, it's, uh, again, it, NATO is a revisionist and expansionist power, and, and Russia, it's, uh, it's simply uh, pushing to hold the status quo. So I think the analysis is uh, somewhat wrong. But you're right. I think uh, NATO is playing uh, by time. It's, it's, it's dragging out uh, negotiations, trying to change realities on the ground. So I think Russia will seek a um, more quick solution if it sees no other alternatives. Pavel Felgenhauer in Moscow, the last word to you. If NATO slash the US does not apply sanctions, is there a dynamic here that might play to NATO's advantage, particularly with reference to Ukraine, and it's Mr Putin? Mr Putin does not have a good track record when it comes to split plate spinning different issues. So he's got his fingerprints on Kazakhstan at the moment. He's got his fingerprints on Ukraine at the moment. He's got his fingerprints on the relationship with NATO at the moment. He doesn't have form when it comes to being able to handle more than one big issue at a time. Russian resources are, of course, limited. Russia is not the Soviet Union. And uh, right now, Russian troops are actually withdrawing from Kazakhstan. They demonstrated their, the very heightened state of alert that they are in. But, they, but Russia don't, doesn't have enough troops and transport planes, and now they're moving them swiftly out, maybe concentrating for a possible uh, crisis that may happen in the West. It's not only Ukraine, it's maybe other things. Russia may deploy new missiles, uh, long, uh, medium-range missiles in uh, forward positions in Crimea, in, uh, in Kaliningrad, maybe in Belarus, to, uh, to give the uh, European countries a sense of threat that, uh, that Russia could then uh, 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 trade for concessions. So we're, I'm afraid, yes, we're moving into a situation where the tensions in Europe are going to grow. It could be a, a conflict, escalation in Ukraine. It could be escalations in other parts of the overall Western Russian divide. OK, very last word to you, Theresa, in Brussels. 30 seconds, that's all you've got. Where we are at the moment seems to be between NATO and Russia, let's agree to disagree. So it's a pretty low bar, but how do they both build on that, assuming that both of them, both sides, Russia and NATO, actually want peace in Europe? They don't want a conflict. I think that they did reach out an olive branch to the Russians, stating that they could discuss missiles. Uh, I think that that's a very key area, and, I, and the Russians seem interested in discussing this. So I think that that's uh, an area that they can build on, so d discussing missiles. And I think that also they should try to pull China into this, because it's in Russia's interest. To, China's not involved in any sort of missile discussions, so that could be a win for the world. So I think that this might open up a new chapter in cooperation. OK, we have to leave it there. Thank you to our guests. They were Theresa Fallon, Pavel Felgenhauer and Glenn Deason. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again anytime via the website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's Facebook.
facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter, our handle as ever at AJ Inside Story from me, Peter Dobby, and the entire team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. We will see you at the usual time tomorrow for the moment. Bye-bye.